Welcome to RPV City Talk. RPV City Talk is brought to you by the City of Rancho Palos Verdes to inform the community on recent city matters. RPV City Talk is a weekly show that features the RPV Mayor, City Council, or City Employees. Hello and thanks for joining us. I am Maria Soreo and this is City Talk and joining us today is our Mayor, Susan Brooks. Thank you for being with us, Susan. Oh, it's great to be here with you, Maria. This has been an exciting month. It's been an exciting week for you. You took a field trip on Monday about the much-talked-about San Ramon Canyon. I did and Maria, because it was so good, um, I think it was it was so educational for me and I think that other people would find this footage educational if if you could show that portion of it and then we could come back and, and do talk about it a recap yes that, that and some of the other items it would be great and Susan knows a lot about the San Ramon Canyon I can tell you that let's take a look at the footage and then we'll come back and discuss well good morning it's another beautiful marine overcast morning here in Rancho Palos Verdes otherwise known as paradise and I'm here this morning with Andy Wingy, Associate um, Engineer for the City of Rancho Palos Verdes Public Works Department. Thank you for coming here this morning to show us what is the largest infrastructure project in the history of the city, the, storm, the San Ramon Storm Drain Project. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah. Thank you, Andy. And Andy, you might want to just run us through, this is the bottom portion of the um, of the project it's a 4,000 foot long project running all the way up to the top of um, the hill up there but right now we're at the bottom we're not at the bottom we're going to go there but can you tell us a little bit about um, this last 300 feet and what's taking place sure. the crane that you see here is at the top of what we call the slant drain that's the beginning of the 300 foot section that runs down the hill at about a 37 degree angle to take water all the way down to the beach. And what they're doing there is that crane is being used to lift dirt out of a pit where the tunneling machine is working to uh, clear a pathway for the pipe to go all the way down to the ocean. Yeah, it's, uh, I was there the other day and uh, we're gonna go back now and it's just awesome to see these guys. This, I think you have to get there. We gotta go there to see what it looks like because Words can't explain it, you have to see it for yourself. So here we are um, near the um, what's going to be the outfall, but before we go over there, I wanted to point out together with Andy that behind us here is the path that runs straight up, is that correct Andy? To the, what you see as the top of the hill up there. That's right. Which would be San Ramon Canyon. This is the alignment of the pipe that will run all the way up uh, past uh, Palos Verdes Drive South, and uh, not quite as far as the houses up on top of the hill, but almost all the way up there. And for informational purposes, we are now on Rancho Palos Verdes land. About 25 feet away from us is San Pedro, and the mobile homes um, on Palos Verdes Shores Mobile Home Park. And uh, if we were not doing this project totally on Rancho Palos Verdes land, we would find ourselves in a precarious situation, which we already did by asking and asking for help from the city of Los Angeles, for the county of Los Angeles, because this, this land runs through what is part of Friendship Park right. as well, county land. And it actually starts in Rancho Palos Verdes up at the top near Tarapaca. So right now, the city has made a decision to go forward by keeping this entire pipe on Rancho Palos Verdes land. And many of these people are very thankful because the city of LA would have had to step in and run it probably underneath their, their That's right. with, with their existing drain, which is in not such great shape, right? Well, we don't know exactly what their condition of their pipe is, but it's old and it uh, wasn't laid in one uh, project and so it has joints and angles that it's like a right angle at some right point. they're not meant to take high flows and especially high flows with uh, debris and boulders and stuff inside of it so yeah we weren't confident that we could we could not create an additional problem by running our pipe through their old system that's right okay that's a good explanation and oh Andy can you tell us about what this, these yellow um, they look like monkey bars these are extensions. They? they are extensions for our boom crane that we'll be using down at the bluff. Uh, right now, we have the crane deployed just to pick up the dirt out of the pit. 
but in a few weeks when we start on our outfall structure, uh, we're using an innovative technique that will allow our workers to access the beach with the use of this extension on the crane. Uh, that saves having to drive heavy machinery across the coast, which is, uh, works in everybody's favor, especially uh, the environmental uh, needs down there. Excellent. Um, I'm just, the more I learn about this project, the more I impress, I'm impressed with the, um, the staff and the consultants, the contractors, uh, L.H. Woods, working on this project. Um, I, it, I just have to say that we have learned so much um, as a result of an, of an inquiry, um, which will probably cost a substantial amount of money in the end. But the fact is that this is the largest infrastructure project citizens do want to know that they're being they're being well served that their resources are being well served and i think it's a good opportunity for us to see just what's going on here okay so we are not in an ant this is not an antique this is not even though it looks like it's from the mesozoic era <laughs> can you tell us a little bit about what what i'm standing in here this is just a large excavator bucket that will be attached to the end of a uh, large piece of equipment that will be used to dig the trench that will be laying the pipe in for about 2,000 feet between the two bore pits Wow, and what about this tractor? This is going to be doing what with this lineup now? That's the excavator right there that will be used for trenching. It's got another bucket on it. The very bottom part of the trench will be squared off. Uh, this bucket back here has the wings on it, making it uh, able to make it a little bit wider. I'm not sure if we can pick up the orange lines on the ground, but they've laid out the alignment for the trench. Oh, down here. Down here. Yeah. So these, this is this is the way the trench is going to go. That's right. The trench will be dug right up here, uphill, down to the pit down there, and up to the pit on the top end. It's got a 54-inch pipe, and then there's about a foot on each side to put bedding material inside. A 54-inch pipe. That was the awesome part to me because I did not realize. I was thinking a 48. The 48-inch pipe is the pipe within the pipe. So. We'll go down and take a look and you can explain to us the pipe within the pipe and the cement between it. Very good. Okay. <laughs> so here we are. We are in the, we are at the, the uh, top of what is the trench, the pit, and um, there are some miners down there that are waiting for instructions that they get from the miners inside that are right now stuck on a rock. They're riveting through a rock with something like a jackhammer. Um, and this yellow tubing is their ox it's their air. And it's coming from the offshore beautiful breezes of the beautiful Palos Verdes Peninsula. And Andy, why don't you tell us a little bit about how they don't have um, how the what the exhaust is doing. Yeah, what they do is they pump this air in through this yellow tube and it creates high uh, pressure that pushes the used air and the any exhaust from machines they have down there back out uh, through another hose inside the yellow tubing there. So the workers are always being refreshed with air at a rate that uh, far exceeds what uh, the OSHA standards are. And uh, they actually come out of the pit uh, fairly refreshed. It's cool in there and uh, the air is good. And uh, aside from the hard work, it's not a bad environment. And so this, this pit that we're looking at, how long did it take to construct this steel mechanism with all this wiring and everything else. Yeah, well it took about uh, a week to actually excavate the pit to dig all the dirt out. And while they dig, they slam these metal plates down into the ground and these posts uh, to keep the pit from caving in. So that's called shoring and we do the digging and the shoring and that was about a week long process. And then the actual company that is doing the tunneling, they came in and installed uh, their hydraulic equipment and their electrical equipment and uh, the actual tunnel casing and ram, hydraulic ram, which this, this fella is standing on right here, uh, that ram pushes the casing into the earth uh, when, when uh, we're ready to advance the casing. So that took probably another week to set up, and then they've been tunneling for the last uh, three weeks or so. They're about halfway down to the bottom. And who in particular is doing the tunneling? It's a company called Drill Tech. Right, because um, I saw their trucks here the other day. That's right, Drill Tech is a subcontractor to LH Woods. They specialize in uh, tunneling and uh, geotechnical engineering construction. You know what, a lot of people have asked me, I, I do these um, Thursdays, on um, every third Thursday, where I meet with constituents, and some people were asking, 
how many subcontractors are there with the contractor? And I had to explain that we're a contract city. We contract out for projects. But I guess I'm asking you this question. With a project of this size, obviously someone like L.H. Woods, they're not going to have all the equipment themselves. Uh, that's true. They do have a good part of it. They're um, experts at installing these storm drain pipes, but the tunneling section was something they needed some help with, so that's a, one of their main subcontractors. There's a few others that bring in uh, equipment for uh, traffic control and things like that, but this is the primary one, and L.H. Woods is doing a huge part of the work on the trenching and uh, installing the welded steel pipe. So this is the casing of the pipe. This is not the actual this, pipe. This what we see, this brown colored steel is a 80 inch diameter casing, we call it. That was it. Jordan before. That's what we were just right. standing in, that's right. We, uh, we ram this into the earth, and then there's a, a tunneling machine which uh, is situated inside another circular type pipe, and the tunneling machine is like a drill. It just drills into the earth and it brings its spoils or the dirt uh, backwards with the, the screws of the drill and those go onto a conveyor that brings it a little bit further up and dumps it into something we call a muck cart. Right. It's and like that, a big tray. And the muck cart, um, actually, uh, the muck cart can be seen over here. This is called the muck cart. Um, this is a sample of one, um, except they ha this was their original muck cart, he explained. But because it was too deep, they had to modify the edge of it, um, and it's more like a tray. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about how this project compares to other projects L.H. Woods has done like this. Well, L.H. Woods uh, is in the business of putting in welded steel pipe, and they do a lot of work for the big water authorities that put in 10, 12 foot, 18 foot diameter pipes to move water from the Colorado River or between reservoirs here in Southern California. So they're very experienced with putting in uh, welded right. steel pipe. So this this sleeve is nothing for them? Uh, no, those sleeves are easy for them to handle. Small no. change, yeah. So here we are, we're, we're getting down here toward um, the bluff top and we just saw some hikers walk by and one of the things the city has done is to maintain access for the um, trails. And what did you say, Andy, when in a couple of weeks, as this drill cost to come in on closer, what will happen then? That's right, when we finish the uh, hole all the way down to the bottom, we'll move the crane a little bit closer to the edge of the bluff, and uh, so we can do the work on the outlet structure. And then we'll have to create a little detour around the crane for the path, but we'll keep it open so every people will be able to use it uh, every day of the week, uh, and it will be uh, maintained. Excellent. Let's go take a look over here at these these uh, metal, these, what are they, steel? These are um, um, steel anchors, anchors. In, buried in concrete. So uh, what are these steel anchors here? What is the purpose of You'll them? see, yeah, there's a steel anchor. It's buried in a concrete uh, post there, and the cable is holding up. Uh, it's hard to see, but it's kind of like chain link fence that right. lays over to really the top of the bluff. Mm -hmm. um, and it's to protect the workers down below from rockfall, from things falling off the bluff. As, as we all know, these are very uh, mobile bluffs. They're somewhat unstable at times with wind or rain events. We'll get uh, debris falling down, so we want to protect the workers. And the chain link fence, is, uh, the chain link material serves to keep the rocks just close uh, to the bluff and they're actually allowed to uh, release from underneath down at the bottom but without tumbling down the hill and endangering either workers or equipment down there. So how high are we here about? Well, I think we're about 80 to 100 feet. 100 I'm not feet. quite sure. 80 to 100 feet uh, up, up, off the ocean. Yeah. And how far down will the pipe come through? The pipe will come down at the bottom of the pipe will be about 20 feet above sea level. Okay. And then we'll have a concrete, what we call a concrete apron or a concrete pad that slants down and still stays above uh, sea level, uh, above the high tide line. Uh, but it will, it, that will protect the beach from the, the rushing water that's coming down uh, until it hits the ocean, the high tide line of the ocean. Uh, so as a storm drain, um, since this is coming from up at the top right there, uh, is there any method of sifting through um, to see that cleaner water gets through here? And yeah, we, it's, uh, we have actually a great advantage here in RPV in that many of our storm drains run through what we call soft bottom canyons. 
And those canyons work to absorb our lower flows, which are usually the ones that carry most of the, the pollution in them. And uh, they absorb into the canyon or they run through vegetation. And okay. both those processes serve to take pollutants out of the stormwater uh, before it's released to the ocean. So Andy, so we've just seen what was happening down at the bottom and now we're up near the top mm -hmm. of um, the, the project. And um, as we look down here, we see this is the canyon. What's going on in here? Well, we're actually bringing in material to restore the old stream bed elevation, bring the canyon level up to support our inlet structure and to provide a path for overflow water. If we have a very big storm that, that exceeds the capacity of our pipe, it will run down this canyon in, uh, over uh, stabilized ground using riprap. So okay. this guy here is uh, compacting earth and moving it around and we'll have a geologist up there testing for compaction rates uh, to make sure that canyon bottom is good and solid. Okay, and um, what, now a year ago you and I came here we and did. we took a hike, I wanted to hike this San Ramon Canyon. This was before we, we, um, we actually were able to move ahead with the project. Right. We had gotten the state matching grant of mm -hmm. nine and a half million and we were searching for assistance from over there, what is here, part of here, mm -hmm. Los Angeles County and down below Los Angeles City. We didn't get it, so we rolled up our sleeves and we said we're going to get going. But where, where ha it seems to me we were a lot deeper than we are now. Yeah, we were about 30 feet below where that uh, piece of equipment is right there when wow. we were walking up the canyon. So we've had to bring up the canyon levels uh, that had oh, been wow. eroded over time. That is... Mm -hmm. That's just awesome that we were 30 feet lower than where they are right now. So you could see how it had eroded over time. That's right. That's so right. So the pipe, where is the pipe actually going to be? Where on the side of the switchbacks, the switchbacks are over there. So as I understand it, we'll be going underneath the switchbacks. That's right. The pipe will pick up water from way up at the top of the canyon there. And the, the alignment of the pipe takes it underneath both of the loops of the switchbacks and uh, ends up down where we were uh, at the top of the bluff down there. So we're, this is, this is to the east of where the pipe is. That way is west there. And uh, we'll, we're, the pipe will run that way and then overflow water and then the natural drainage through the canyon will run down through here. Okay. Susan, I was most impressed with the fact that you got right down in there and you talked to the workers, you talked to everybody there, and it was really hands-on to explain what they're doing in there because it's one thing to talk about San Ramon and the different things that have gone on, but to actually see it, to see the pipe, to see the work they're doing is a whole other ballgame. Yeah, you know, at one point I started to feel like Huel Hauser. I, I can understand how that guy was so passionate, mm -hmm. but when you really engage yourself in something like this and you see how passionate these people are about their job, right. which makes me really understand in retrospect that when we went through this little inquiry, which was not really a little inquiry, it's going to cost a lot of money in the end, right. um, you get to see why it is these people are so passionate about their profession, their livelihood and what they do. And I'm really, I feel we're really blessed to have people who are so professional in there working um, not just in that pipe, but um, you know, I was asked about the concept of contractors. Well, we are a contract city. Right. So as a contract city, we contract out with most of our services, with fire, with um, police, with sheriff's department. But we also contract within our public works department huh? because we can't possibly like this, be like the city of LA that has all its own forklifts and big tractors. But even the city of LA contracts with companies like LH Woods and Drill Tech and these other contractors and subcontractors that are working on this project. So oh. that was what was so fascinating. Well, anything for people to understand that these are these are experts in their field. They know exactly what they're doing. They're putting all of the right materials together. And that was what was so fascinating, watching you learn all about this hands-on right there. And that's why I, I thought, when, once we started doing it, initially I just did it because I thought we could get some footage, we could see what's going on. I was curious. Right. But once we started doing it, Maria, I realized, wow, this, you know, in the, in the scheme of things, 
what's really going to happen in the end? Right. Well, in the end, people are going to see a natural terrain. There will be manhole covers over this in order to go in and inspect those pipes because right. they're going to need periodic inspections. And right next door, of course, is the city of um, of, Sam, of Los Angeles, exactly. the mobile home park, um, South Shore's mobile home park, and the residents there have been very good and very accommodating and very thankful, I might add, um, to Rancho Palos Verdes for um, helping them with which would otherwise um, put their lives in peril right. uh, without doing this project. Uh, so this is a life-saving project. It is an excellent, it's, it's, it's engineered to the T. Mm -hmm. And the fact that we've got people out there um, working 24-7. Right. 24-7. And, you know, they, well, 24-7 in uh, protection in other areas. But when they, within their work day, they make about 10 feet of headway a day. Isn't that amazing? And that... <sighs> Well, when I thought, at first I thought, well, that's not a lot. Right, but, but then when I you realized it. <laughs> it's an 80 inch pipe. Exactly. You stand inside that pipe. You were pipe. inside I, of it. Oh, yes. yes. <laughs> and so when you realize that, now that's not the pipe, mind you, that's the sleeve. Right. That, down at the bottom, they're using a steel sleeve. Up at the top, they'll be using a concrete enclosure. But this is the steepest portion that goes 300 feet down to the ocean now. Right. And those guys are in that tunnel. But in there with them is the oxygen yes. and the exhaust. And they come out looking like they're great. You know, they're right. rejuvenated. They, they, I, I expect it to be like a coal miner or something. Well, I think one of the most fascinating things was when I saw the guy come out of, the, of that gi gigantic hole where the pipe is, and I thought, oh, my gosh, there's people down inside of there yes, working. Yes, yes. And, and they actually, as part of the safety, I don't know if you saw the portion uh, if Mark videotaped that, where they actually have to take their key with their name and put in or out, in or out, whether they're in the pipe or out of the pipe. For safety so you reasons, never obviously. Leave somebody. Yeah. And, you know, the, the muck bucket, the bucket that's in there, had to be modified right. to accommodate um, this particular sleeve. Huh? So they come out with a pile of dirt and they dump the dirt. Eventually, the dirt's going to go back in its natural location, and it will be um, revegetated. But it will be uh, what is taking place now underneath the surface. It's I wonder what it was like when they did when when they built places like New York subway system. Can you imagine? It makes me want to go down <laughs> under the New York subway. And you know, there's a whole city under underneath. New York That's of right. just the water. And uh, it's, it's fascinating. And I'm sure back even in the days when they first started this, they didn't have the oxygen going down there because they yes, didn't know right. about that. So now, mm -hmm. of course, the safety measures are, are so much OSHA different. OSHA is yes. there on site. All the time. In fact, the inspector was there on site. We had our hard hats on. Yes, you were uh, ready. We to stay far away. <laughs> You know, so. what, what do you think you learned the most going under there, going in there and really looking at everything? What, what were your impressions as far as things you didn't know about San Ramon? Well, I think what I didn't realize probably was the depth of um, intensity with which the water is going to be flowing. Right. I mean, you can hear about the fact that the water, and you can go see at McCarroll Canyon, for right. example, mm -hmm. how the water is, is, you know, rolling through that thing really fast. And six-inch six rocks, um, which are not supposed to be able, anything larger than six inches is not supposed to get through McCarroll Canyon. But when you see here, you know, they're, they're going to have all their drainage up, up, up um upstream, but by the same token, it's the force with which, and, and when you think about those floods and when they happened, right. uh, the videotape that we saw from uh, Mr. Um, Brubaker, I believe it was, mm -hmm. who came and he did a PowerPoint presentation. He lives in the mobile home park. He showed boulders going through, yep. and uh, you know, it wasn't necessarily a rainstorm. Right. So, the interesting thing is that the water can come at any time. That's right. Because it comes from aquifers also. So it was fast. I think was what was fascinating was the level of, um, fascinating to me because it's not my specialty. Exactly. But um, the level of professionalism, mm -hmm. the level of um, detail that is being, um, it's so important. I've, uh, I'm really proud to live in Rancho Palos Verdes to see so many, and, and I have to say our public works department, 
Um, Great job. Ron Dragu, yep. uh, Andy Wingy, mm -hmm. these guys are right on top of things. And um, Alan Bradvet, who is the chief consultant um, overseeing the project, he is there all the time. I mean, he's even, somebody was out sick the other day, and when we saw him, he was sweaty, and <laughs> it was nice, you know, cool morning. And yeah, he had to be running up and down the canyon to cover up for to cover in to cover for somebody uh -huh. else who was not able to come because they were sick. And Andy was there with you. And, and Andy was there. His he knowledge was, just unbelievable. Yeah, Andy is great. Um, yeah, we are really fortunate to have these people with us in in public works. Well, Susan, always a hot topic, of course, San Ramon. We're going to be right back with more. We're going to take a break. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Deputy Chris Knox, here to remind you of the importance of traffic safety near our schools. School zones are always 25 miles per hour. A school zone only applies when students are outside the school in the morning and the afternoon. Parents should always allow extra time when dropping off their children and should know the school's drop-off routes and procedures. Motorists should also focus on safe driving near schools. Some of the violations I see near schools are cell phones, speeding, double parking, seat belts, and child safety seats. Students should always remember to cross safely at intersections and not to run out in front of cars. When we follow these rules, we can all stay safe. are back with our mayor talking about hot topics in Rancho Palos Verde. Susan, another one is always crime and making sure that people lock their doors, do all the right things. And when we were at your coffee last week, something that really um, I thought was amazing was the one resident who said that there was crime in her neighborhood. Yes, she was new. She just, that was her first time at, at our coffee, our third Thursdays, we're calling them. Okay, now. the third Thursday. <laughs> and she said that Seventy people showed up at her house with Captain Bolin, and he right. brought two deputies with him. And they went through a whole presentation, which, by the way, they said they would do for any neighborhood that is interested in putting a watch together. But seventy people showed up at her house right. to show you that it's it's so important. People think because this is such a small community that nobody is going to come in and, and try to do the quick grabs. But because this is a destination city now, we are seeing more and more people come in. We are, and thank you, Maria. This mm -hmm. is so important. Um, Anthony, Misit Councilman Misitich and I are on the Regional Law Enforcement Committee. And on that committee, uh, we meet quarterly with the other neighboring cities that we share sheriff's um, services with, LA right. County Sheriff's Services with, Rolling Hills Estates and Rolling Hills. And so we have the, our next quarterly meeting is coming up next week. But um, usually the Sheriff's Department likes to look at quarterly crime statistics. Right. But there is no denying that what we have seen um, of late are real challenges to, uh, to this community. Mm -hmm. um, I want to really point out that I'm very, very, I'm so impressed with um, um, people like the resident who came forward, Mrs. Hodges, and yes. she's organizing Neighborhood Watch. And she's doing it together with our Neighborhood Watch Coordinator for Rancho Palos Verdes, and that's Gail Lorenzen. Yep. Gail Lorenzen is, in my mind, she's a superhero. She's amazing, yes. <laughs> she has done, for over as long, when I was on the council last time, 20 years ago, she was doing this. She it's started amazing. this. And she has been doing this, and... Uh, you know, she has, she has her own set of challenges. You get carpal tunnel, you know, when you're typing all the time. Right. But she typed and did today a beautiful, crime, not a beautiful, but a very detailed and a very intense crime report. We are still a relatively safe city. We of would course. still be considered in the scheme in of In the grand things. scope, When you yes. look at Los Angeles, mm -hmm. you know, a, a bedroom safe community. But because we have these more destination resorts, because we have open space that people travel to, because we have bicyclists who are coming, only 10% believe, who are believed to be residents of the peninsula are actually the ones who are traversing the entire peninsula. Oh, many people um, come into the community we, to ride. We just, we are for our, our access road of Palos Verdes Drive has become more like a freeway, she points out. Mm -hmm. And she points out why it is that um, she uses a, uses a statistic here that, um, that you know, it, it, 
it could sound quite alarming. Mm -hmm. And so I don't want us to be alarmed at something like this, but I want us to be cognizant. Right. I mean, if we looked at the first quarter crimes from this first quarter compared to the last quarter, we were 8% down mm -hmm. in what were called aggravated assaults. But this quarter, starting in March and April and May, that's when things really revved up. Right. So we're going to have a significant, I believe, a significant increase. But she points out that in the first six months of 2013, the crime was up 43% compared with the same time five years ago. Okay. Okay. She went back to five years ago. And she does coordinate with the Sheriff's Department very closely. Right. So, um, she, she, she is um, just outstanding, the way she details the things that are happening and why this is happening. Mm -hmm. You know, there is um, not just the, we live in different times. People here right. have unlocked, they, they have left their doors unlocked, they have left their, their car doors unlocked with their keys in them to their house. Exactly. But it's going beyond that also. So not only do we have to try to keep our cars off the street, which, by the way, the, when the city was founded, you know, the goal was to try to do as they do in the other two peninsula cities that are not gated, Rolling Hills Estates and, and Palisbury Estates. They actually keep all cars off the street after 2 a.m. Mm -hmm. They don't have overnight street parking. In some areas in Rancho Palisbury, you can't do that. But in residential communities, if you can try to get them up into the driveway, and get surveillance cameras in, in our neighborhood, right. we're doing it, and uh, get them at the entries to your neighborhood. Um, HD cameras so that you can actually see license plates if something happens. But if we are ever vigilant, we're not gonna make it easy for these criminals. No. Because the realignment program by the governor um, is, um, has released, well, the dictate is to release 43,000. Um, thus far, maybe 25,000 have been released. Um, I believe it's six, um, maybe it's 20, 16,000 of which are in LA County. And last week I was talking to the mayor of um, Torrance, mm -hmm. um, Frank Scotto, at right. the Sanitation District Board meeting, and he mentioned that there were 70 in Torrance alone. Now you might say, okay, so they're, you know, these are eas easily, you know, some can be rehabilitated, which is true. Right. But some more, um, this is supposed to be non-violent offenders. Right. And some of these people have, they're just out um, without even parole because of this mandate um, and the fact that the prisons were overcrowded and the budget was bad. And in 2011, the Supreme Court of California um, as she states here, um, ordered them to cut the population of the prisons to relieve this overcrowding. So rather than send them to places like Arizona, which I think would be good, um, because they have here. a great program there, that sheriff in Arizona. Yeah, they're not or messing around. Rather than send the criminals to other states or farm them out, they some came to the county, but some were just released. Right. Um, and the county prison system, was jail system, was not made to hold um, prisoners for more than a year. Um, the state prisoners are a lot nicer in terms of accommodations. So it's, it's going to make for a real pressure well, cooker situation. And the things, situation. the things that we don't know as residents, remembering people say, oh, my, all the doors are locked in my house, but their car is unlocked, and then there's a remote to get into the garage. So people can just kind of walk right in right. through a garage. So there's so many things that people, uh, the residents, have to be aware of to know that the criminals already know how to get in. So you've got to block them out at every, at every stage of the game. Yeah, at this point, we just really need to look at ourselves as being... Um, a beautiful community that a lot of people envy, uh -huh. and right. uh, one that we, I keep calling it paradise. Right. Well, sometimes there's trouble in paradise, Maria, and we really wanna make sure that we're vigilant. And the way we do that is organize with Neighborhood Watch. Uh -huh. I right. would say contact Gail Lorenzen through the Neighborhood Watch program, okay. and we can get that number on yes. the screen. We'll get her website. And her website, uh -huh. um, and her email address. Uh -huh because it, um, she will help get you started. And if you don't have a homeowners association, mm -hmm. sometimes a neighborhood watch program on a one block will help start a whole homeowners association. Absolutely. As was the case with that woman at the coffee last week. That's right, and you know what, I wanted to talk about the coffee. I wanna to touch on that. People come and they wanna to talk to you about 
things that are on their minds, things going on in the community. Right. What are, I, that was my first time there. What do people bring up to you? We, we heard the crime. We heard different things just at that one. But what do you find that people are asking you? Well, people usually ask questions. Thanks, Maria. You know, I, I initially started it just as coffee with the councilwoman, mm -hmm. third Thursdays at Starbucks and Golden Cove. They're going to run out of chairs, by the way, at Starbucks. It's a beautiful place, <laughs> yeah. you know. Um, and it really just started as an opportunity for some people who might feel intimidated in some way to go to a council meeting and speak up. Mm -hmm. Public, you know, public speaking is the number one fear. It is, that's before right. Before dying. I know, isn't that Why crazy? Why don't we have that problem? I don't know. Anyway. <laughs> we definitely um, don't. <laughs> no, but, um, but meanwhile, uh, a lot of people who do come like to share information about um, concerns that they have or their point of view on something or ask more for more information on an item. When someone has a very personal issue and they come, I make a private arrangement with them nice. to meet with them. I, I meet with a lot of people mm -hmm. at Starbucks privately without it being a, a, group. a group. This is mm -hmm. like a little focus group almost and it changes all the time. Mm -hmm. The dynamics changed. Um, Councilman Campbell even sent his campaign um, he was there. intern yeah. there. Mm -hmm. So we did get, and, and Councilman Knight showed up yeah. um, this time. So uh, it was nice to have, it was nice, you know, to share that opportunity with somebody. This is evolves into a very bright group of people. Well, it's very positive as well. I thought the group yes. was, everybody was just well-spoken and it was comfortable, which is a tribute to you. Well, thanks, but you yeah. know, I think it's, I, I just think it's a tribute to the great, you know, I went on KNX radio the other day, um, they were doing um, On Your Corner, mm -hmm. and they called all the mayors from the Peninsula Cities as well as um, down in San Pedro, and they were down at the bird, um, oil bird sanctuary yes. down where the animal care center is, mm -hmm. and you know, all of a sudden the guy asked me, uh, the Jim Thornton asked me this question. You know, you only get a minute there. Of course, quick. And he asked a question. I had no clue what they were going to do. But, you know, he said, all right, if you had just one thing that you could say that was great about um, Rancho Palos Verdes, what would you say? And I just thought, wow, I mean, when you live in paradise, what? I said, well, the people. Mm. The people, but as a respite, for me, the Wayfarer's Chapel because that is a favorite personal place. But the people are what makes this, it's what makes me stay here. I mean, my children are grown and essentially gone. Right. And uh, my family are, live elsewhere. So yeah. my, your friends become your family. I was going to say your other family, those, everybody that lives here, I think. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Every time I'm pulling these names now out of the hat or for the recycling drawing. You know or that. <laughs> we're calling, I'm realizing I know that person. I know that person. That's what happens when you've been in, around for a while. That's a good thing. Another good thing is your newsletter, Susan. And oh, we want to let people know how they can um, sign up and be on the list. So what can they do? Sure. Well, the newsletter, actually, um, I actually run that information through a City Hall to okay. confirm mm -hmm. that my facts are facts. And it's not a political newsletter. Uh, so please don't mistake it. No, with it's informational. Mistaken it. Mm -hmm. um, mistake. You know, mistake it with uh, something that might be more politically driven. My goal there is really to try to inform people about activities that will be of importance to them. Right. So I think the best way to do it is to just send an email to to me through City Hall at I believe it's at rpv.com. Okay. You send it to Susan Brooks and it'll be susan.brooks at rpv.com. Okay. And just say you'd like to be added to the newsletter list and I can put you on that because that comes out of a separate um, email address. Great. It doesn't come through the city. Some of the residents were asking that as well. Now, 4th of July this year, we have to tell you, was oh, that was awesome. It was a huge success. Susan got right in there. She was uh, playing some games and took the mic. and got wrapped up in toilet paper. You got wrapped up, and that was a lot of fun. And it I was. think so many people I came out for ring. that. See, we shopped. It was a good thing, all of it. Ring. But more people, I think, came this year, Susan, than any other year. It just gets bigger and 4, bigger 000. and bigger. I, I, yes, at least. There were right. so many people. It was great. And uh, I, I really want to give the credit to the staff. Mm -hmm. because They did a great job. Um, 
then here's another case, you know, where the staff has worked so hard. Um, you know, Carolyn Lair, the city manager, she ended up actually uh, running some of the, the, the games. The games. She was great. narrating them. Well, why was she great? Because she used to be a Parks and yes. Rec director. <laughs> she so knows how to play the games. That's helpful. And, <laughs> yes. of course, Carolyn Petru. And, but, of course, the other staff members and Matt Waters, he, you know, right. he, he puts on all these hats as well, mm -hmm. um, you know, helped out. So there were just the, the staff, you know, Mona, Nancy, everyone, they were just merry. They were all right on top of it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what makes it so successful. Right. I mean, it, it's great to have the production company come in and, and have the dancing and have the games. But they added more games this year. We had they 40 did. Cent Hot Dogs. They went over really well. Yeah. We had uh, 40 Hula Cent Hoop. Rides. Yes, 40 oh, Cent oh. Kettle Corn. I thought I was going to do was that awesome. Hula Hoop contest. But they didn't like those you, huh? Hula Hoops were too... Light. <laughs> I like a weighted hula hoop. They said the weighted hula hoops are much easier. Oh. Plus, they're exercise. There you go. So, yeah. yeah, that was a lot of fun. It was. And of course, they had the uh, 40th anniversary booth. Yes. With all of the history, um, it was it was just just done so well and so oh, much to look at and, and see. And we went on the helicopter ride. My daughter and yes, I. Yes, tell us about and that. And we took video of video footage of uh, the San Ramon Canyon. Right. Uh, so my daughter Meredith is a videographer, and mm -hmm. she was videotaping from the front of the helicopter, and she's sending that into the city so the city can use it. Now, was that the first it time shows... you'd ever gone up in a helicopter? Oh, no, no. I've been in helicopters she's a pro. many times. <laughs> no, I've, I was in helicopters back and forth to Catalina a lot when I was running for Congress 20 years ago. Wow. But, um, no, I go in, I've been in helicopters quite often. But this... Um, it does give you a beautiful area of aerial view of the coast. Amazing. But we did get to, to go a, a little through San Ramon Canyon, and, you know, they filled in 30 feet of it. Um, since I walked in it with Which Ron is... Dragu and Andy Wingy a year ago, wow. and, you know, I said I wanted to be airlifted out because of the rocks and how high it was, but you could see how they covered it all up, and they were compacting it when we were there the other day. So that's what's going on on the upper end. And the part that that video took us in through earlier mm -hmm. was the lower end. Right. So things are happening at both ends at the same time. It's just uh, so it was nice really for you to be able to see from above yes. where everything is and what and they were And they doing. mentioned they would like to see that. Um, the contractors would like to see that as well. I'd like to see that aerial view of it. So. We have to get your That's daughter on That's pricey footage to yeah. get to <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> well, Susan, always a lot going on. We always appreciate you coming here These every month. These are exciting times. They really are, and you're doing a great job. Oh, uh, thank you. You are doing a great job. Thank I think you. that uh, you know, I want to thank members of the council who are putting in their time That's and right. rolling up their sleeves because this job is not a job where you just show up every other week. No. And if you do, it becomes a real burden for your cohorts because then your cohorts have to pick up for the slack because there are a number of committees you know there's many, a lot of work over to do. 20 that really we need to do work for so that's very very important all right susan thank you again for joining us we will see you next great month. to be with you maria great to be with you and thank you for joining us we're going to leave you with our special 40th anniversary landmarks video and we'll see you next time on city talk Rancho Palos Verdes is a jewel on the coastline, a city that garners breathtaking views, miles of open space, and landmarks that attract the world. One of the most recognizable landmarks is the Point Vicente Lighthouse, which stands tall along the bluffs and is a true symbol of the peninsula. The lighthouse was built in 1926 and is operated by the Coast Guard. It has a fascinating history and is on the National Registry of Historic Places. Next to the lighthouse is the Point Vicente Interpretive Center. People come from near and far to watch the migration of the gray whale. I have been a docent for 20 years, so I've seen lots of changes, and it is definitely the most wonderful place on the peninsula. Just across the shore from the Palos Verdes Interpretive Center sits the Terranea Resort, which reflects the beauty and history of the land in Rancho Palos Verdes. There were many, many architectural drawings, and we really looked at how the land kind of cascaded down. 
Everything that we, everything that we blasted for the main building, we made sure that all of that rock was used in all of retaining walls. Nelson's rock is PV rock from our building. We did, uh, we crushed it for our road beds. So we really um, looked carefully at what we could do with the land. We wanted to feel like we weren't new glitz and glam, that, that we were part of the heritage of um, the peninsula. It was so important for us to embrace this community. We feel privileged to be on this site in this land, and we're part of a broader community. And so we wanted to act as a responsible corporate citizen, as a responsible neighbor, making sure that everyone's welcome and they can walk the pathways and feel like this is really their property. And before the spectacular property was Terranea, it was another treasure in the community called Marineland. We were actually startled at how many people were involved with Marineland over the years. Yeah. Nelson's we named after um, Lloyd Bridges and yeah. his character um, here that he dove in the tanks here at Marineland. You look at a sunset at Nelson's at the end of the day and you say, I'm so grateful that I get to come here every day and serve. Um, this beautiful community and our guests. Not far from Terranea and nestled in nature is the world famous Wayfarers Chapel built in 1951 by architect Lloyd Wright. The Wayfarers Chapel is a Swedenborgan chapel and people come from all over the world to get married here and marvel at the unique architecture. Across the road from the Wayfarers Chapel is Abalone Cove Shoreline Park it's one of nearly 20 parks run by the city. Abalone Cove, or Ab Cove, has two beaches, tide pools, hiking trails, and picnic areas along the bluffs. No matter what park you visit in RPV, you will find beautiful nature surrounding you. And just down the road at Trump National Golf Course is Founders Park and Marilyn Ryan Sunset Park, which have spectacular views. And speaking of spectacular views, you won't find a golf course anywhere that's as stunning as the views from Trump National Golf Club. It really is, it's the best course. It's considered better than Pebble Beach, better than any of the courses in California. I also spent a tremendous amount of money bringing it to a level because when I bought it, it was a good course in a great location. Right. And you still had the ocean, but you didn't have the ocean like you have it now because we made the vistas much bigger and the course is a much bigger course. Uh, Pete Dye was the architect and he did a fantastic job. Every single hole is either on the ocean or a view of the ocean and there's no course like that in California. I hear it all the time. I mean they talk about the greens are wonderful and the course is wonderful and they love the clubhouse but people talk about the great help and the people that yeah. work here whether it's Lily or any of the other people, the chef who we think is just the best and they love the food, they love the ambiance but they do love the people. The city has been really spectacular. I mean, they want this to be the best. They're very proud of it. Yes. And we appreciate that, and we've really had a great relationship with them. The Palos Verdes Peninsula Land Conservancy has enjoyed a long-time collaboration with the city of Rancho Palos Verdes, working together to preserve this wonderful open space, which is the 1,400-acre Palos Verdes Nature Preserve. This is such a community treasure and landmark. It has amazing trails running through it with great habitat, wonderful scenic vistas, and lovely wildlife. The Land Conservancy's pledge to the community is that this open space is preserved for generations to come. No matter where you are in Rancho Palos Verdes, the landscape shines brightly. There are cultural and architectural wonders to see, businesses, schools and institutions to enjoy, and a treasure-filled community to celebrate. We congratulate um, the city on their 40-year anniversary. We're very happy to be part of their celebration.